this series of lectures on seismic analysis of structures, we shall be covering six major topics namely seismology, seismic inputs, then the response analysis of structures for deterministic ground motion, the response analysis of structures for random ground motion using the spectral method of analysis. Then uh, the seismic response spectrum method of analysis and finally, the inelastic response of structures uh, for earthquake. We shall uh, use the book by T K Datta on seismic analysis of structures published by John Wiley. The uh, PPTs and uh, the lecture materials uh, all are prepared from that book. The last uh, two uh, links shows the or uh, records uh, the errata list of the book. So, they are available from these uh, web links. The first three on the top uh, wave links, uh, they have the slides uh, for this lecture series and one can download uh, those uh, slides uh, free of charge because uh, they are uh, uploaded in a public domain. Now, before I uh, start uh, the uh, seismic analysis of uh, structures, uh, especially uh, the uh, first topic that is the seismology. Uh, let me uh, give you a very brief uh, uh, introduction about earthquake. Earthquake is a sudden and transient disturbance or motion uh, on the surface of the earth produced due to geological disturbance within the earth itself. The earth has suffered hundreds of millions of earthquake in its formative stage uh, before the human race came into existence. In the olden days, uh, people used to uh, think earthquake as a curse of God like other natural disasters. It is only in the 17th century or rather the mid of 17th century uh, that the earthquake was viewed as a geological process. Since then, systematic data and observations were recorded and utilizing uh, those observations and the data, uh, people try to understand about the earthquake phenomena uh, occurring uh, in the earth uh, as a geological process. Those uh, data also helped in uh, providing uh, the methods for the rational uh, design and analysis of structures against earthquake. Uh, those data also uh, revealed some interesting features about earthquake that is its uh, probabilistic nature. Uh, the future earthquakes are uh, all random uh, in the sense that the occurrence of earthquake uh, is uh, not precisely known. Uh, therefore, the probabilistic modeling of earthquake and uh, the probabilistic analysis of structures uh, for the probabilistic ground motion became important. Uh, both the uh, seismologists and earthquake engineers, they are uh, interested in the recorded data, uh, but for different purposes. Uh, the seismologists uh, use the data for understanding uh, the earthquake as a geological process and try to look into the different uh, causes, aspects uh, and uh, other 
associated phenomena that led to a better understanding of the earthquake process as such. Whereas, uh, the earthquake engineers use uh, the data for constructing uh, seismic inputs for uh, structures and for analyzing and designing the structures. Uh, so, the, uh, the data uh, which are recorded uh, they are utilized uh, by both seismologists and the earthquake engineers uh, for their uh, own professional purposes. Uh, the data uh, that is uh, uh, recorded uh, they are systematically uh, analyzed and many kinds of inputs for the analysis of structures were constructed uh, from this particular data. Now, before uh, I uh, get into the uh, seismology uh, that is the first part of uh, the, our first topic uh, of the lecture. Now, let me tell you that uh, the seismology itself is a very big subject and rather a, a, a can form uh, a, a series of lectures on the seismology itself. Uh, but there are uh, certain portions of the seismology that are of great interest uh, to earthquake engineers as well as to the seismologist as I told you before. Uh, they include the following uh, that is the uh, causes of earthquake, earthquake waves, measurement of earthquake, effect of soil condition on earthquake then earthquake prediction and earthquake hazard analysis. So, these are the few topics on seismology that we will be discussing uh, in uh, the first few lectures of uh, this series. Understanding of these topics uh, help in uh, earthquake design and analysis uh, of the structure in a better way. Uh, further, the knowledge of seismology is helpful in describing earthquake inputs for structures where enough recorded data is not available. This is extremely important uh, because uh, there are many places where uh, the earthquakes do occur and there uh, is not a systematic recording data on the first earthquake. In those areas, uh, one can and construct artificially some earthquake inputs from the knowledge of seismology uh, that earthquake engineers derive out of uh, the data recorded on earthquake. Uh, the seismology uh, that we sh uh, shall be uh, discussing here requires some knowledge of uh, the interior of the earth. So, before uh, we look uh, into the earthquake as a geological process, uh, let us have a uh, look into the interior of the earth. The figure 1.1 shows uh, that the earth is made of, of several layers. The top layer uh, is called the uh, crust. It is uh, a solid plate like uh, substance slightly curved so that it can cover uh, the entire outer surface of the earth. Immediately uh, below the crust is the mantle. Uh, mantle uh, is a uh, is made up of molten material and therefore, uh, there is a, a distinct discontinuity uh, between the mantle and the crust. The mantle is uh, supported on the outer core and the inner core uh, forming the core of the earth. Each uh, one of these layers that is the inner core, uh, outer core, mantle and the crust uh, they have uh, successively uh, less density 
uh, that means the crust although it is uh, a solid uh, object uh, is having a less density compared to the mantle. Similarly, mantle has a less density compared to outer core and so on. Each layer has some distinct features and uh, these distinct features in fact are the uh, causes for many of the geological processes uh, that takes place uh, within the earth. First uh, let us take the crust. The crust is a uh, solid object or solid uh, material that I uh, told before. Uh, its thickness uh, varies from 5 to 40 kilometer. The least thickness is found uh, near the sea bottom, whereas the maximum thickness uh, is observed in the region of the mountains. The seismic wave velocity uh, through the crust is around 4 to 8 kilometer per second. Uh, as I uh, told you before, there exist a distinct discontinuity between the crust and the, the molten uh, mantle and this uh, discontinuity is uh, called the M discontinuity after the name of the scientist Mohorovic who first uh, discovered uh, this disc, uh, discontinuity by observing a sudden change of the seismic wave velocity uh, as uh, the uh, seismic waves propagates from the crust to the mantle. The crust as such floats on the mantle uh, with a by, uh, by taking a portion of the mantle along with it. Next uh, we look into the property of the mantle. The mantle consists of again three distinct portions. The top portion is called the lithosphere which is about 120 kilometer deep. Uh, this uh, lithosphere is integrally connected to the crust so that the crust along with the mantle moves uh, over the rest of the mantle. Immediately below the lithosphere is the asthenosphere. This asthenosphere is a plastic molten rock it is having a thickness about 200 kilometer. The uh, rest of the part of the mantle which is the bottom part of the mantle is fairly homogeneous and therefore, there is a less variation of the seismic wave velocity uh, within uh, this zone. The thickness of the mantle is about 1000 kilometer to 2900 kilometer. Next uh, is the core. Uh, it was discovered by Wicker and Oldham. It is so dense uh, that only P waves can pass through the inner core which is about 1 to 9 0 kilometer thick. Uh, it is a very dense and very rare materials like nickel and iron. They are uh, existing or they are found uh, in the inner core. The immediately outside the inner core is the outer core which has a thickness about 2200 kilometer. It has more or less the same density as that of the inner core. Uh, the temperature within the core is about 2500 uh, degrees centigrade. Pressure is about 4 into 10 to the power 6 atmospheric pressure and the density uh, with the of the uh, core is about 14 gram per centimeter cube. As I told you uh, the lithosphere uh, along with the crust float as a cluster of plates 
with uh, different movements in uh, different directions. This cluster of plates is uh, known as the tectonic plates and the movement of uh, these tectonic plates constitutes what is known as the plate tectonics uh, uh, responsible for uh, the earthquake uh, that is uh, caused uh, due to the geological disturbances. So, let us look into the plate tectonics which means uh, the movement of the plate giving rise to different kind of, of, of interesting phenomena. The concept of plate tectonics emerged from the continental drift. In order to understand uh, the continental drift, uh, let us have a look at uh, figure 1.2. Uh, we can see uh, that uh, in this figure, the in the mantle part, there is a convective current and this convective current is produced uh, due to the energy uh, that is uh, coming from the radioactivity of uh, the earth itself. The, uh, these are the portions or, or, or the uh, part of the uh, mantle uh, which moves upward and uh, it flows uh, through the gap between the two plates. The reason uh, for the uh, presence of these gaps between uh, the cluster of plates uh, is that these convective currents are not uniform all through and uh, also there exists a difference in the temperature and the pressure all along on the uh, periphery of the mantle. As a result of that, the solid portion of uh, the outer uh, surface of the earth known as the crust is not a one single unit covering uh, the entire uh, surface of the earth and there exists a gap between two segments or in other words these uh, uh, crust like plate that is uh, consisting of a, a number of plates and between two plates uh, there is a gap. So, through this gap uh, the mantle flows outward uh, because of the convective current. Uh, this phenomena give rise uh, to uh, the movement of the plates uh, in different directions with uh, different velocity and uh, uh, this is uh, known as the uh, plate tectonics. Now, uh, at the mid oceanic ridges where uh, two continents were joined together uh, in the past at some uh, point uh, in the geological time, there uh, the uh, drift started between the uh, two uh, plates because of the uh, upward flow of the uh, hot mantle. Uh, as a result of that, uh, the plates, two plates uh, drifted apart and uh, gave rise to the formation of the continents that we see today. And therefore, uh, the plate tectonics is uh, the concept of plate tectonics came from the what you call continental drift. The flow takes place uh, because of the convective circulation of the earth's mantle that I showed before and also I mentioned that uh, this convective current is present uh, because of the energy that it derives uh, from the radioactivity inside the earth. Now, as the hot materials uh, comes to the surface uh, through the gap, it cools down and uh, forms 
uh, additional crust and uh, this additional crust tries to make its own place. The new crust that is formed sinks uh, beneath the sea surface, a spreading continues and when the lithosphere part of the tectonic plate reaches deep sea trenches, uh, then uh, a subduction process takes place that is uh, the crust which is already existing is uh, experiencing a kind of thrust uh, because of the new crust that is formed and because of this uh, thrust one uh, plate which is already existing uh, goes below the other plate and this process is uh, known as the subduction process. Uh, we will uh, discuss about this sub subduction process uh, in more detail little later. So, uh, the, uh, the or material or of the existing plates uh, which gets uh, into the uh, molten uh, material uh, of the mantle uh, that uh, uh, starts uh, what melting down and as a result of uh, that the old crust or the existing crust, they gradually melt down and the new crust is formed at the gaps and thus there is a mass balance uh, between the, uh, the crust which is uh, newly formed and the crust that melts down uh, due to the subduction process. The continental motions uh, are associated with a variety of circular uh, circulation patterns uh, and uh, because of this variety of circulation patterns only uh, we have uh, the uh, movement of the plates that is continually taking place. The uh, movement of the plates essentially uh, takes place through sliding of lithospheres and uh, as I told you uh, before. Uh, these uh, sliding uh, takes place in pieces and uh, uh, these uh, give rise uh, to the movement of the tectonic plates uh, known as the plate tectonics. There are uh, seven such major tectonic plates and uh, many smaller ones. Uh, they move in different directions at different speeds that I uh, told you before. Uh, here in this figure we can see those seven plates. Uh, this is the Eurasian plate, uh, this is the North American plate, uh, this is the Pacific plate, uh, this is Indo-Australian plate, then this is South American plate, uh, this is African plate and this is the Antarctic plate. Between two plates uh, we can see that the fault lines uh, or the gap between the two plates that is continuously uh, present or in fact these fault lines or the gaps uh, divide between the two uh, plates. And uh, the, these fault lines and gaps are very important in the sense that in this uh, fault or the boundaries of the plate, uh, some uh, tectonic activities uh, take place resulting in the earthquake process that we will be uh, describing little later. Three types of interplate uh, boundaries uh, that are existing. Uh, these uh, boundaries uh, are existing because of uh, the different kinds of interactions between the plates that take place. The first one is the convergent boundary where one plate uh, goes below the other plate which I describe 
little before and this process is known as the subduction process. Uh, the uh, plate which uh, goes into the uh, molten mantle uh, that uh, melts away and merges with, with the mantle. Uh, thus, there is a mass balance between the new plate created and the existing plates melting away. Uh, because of the subduction process that is one plate going below the other, there is a upward thrust created onto the adjacent plate and this upward thrust uh, makes uh, the end of the other plate uh, going up. Uh, this is uh, responsible for the creation of the mountain. The Himalayan mountain that we see today was about a few a feet height only at some point in the geological past. And right now, the, this Himalayan mountain has uh, come to its own size uh, because of this uh, subduction process, process that is continuously taking place. Uh, this is uh, called the transform boundary. At the transform boundary, two plates pass each other and uh, the, this fault is called transform fault and we can see that in the transform fault the two plates uh, move parallel to each other uh, perpendicular uh, to the uh, perpendicular to the surface of the paper. Uh, this is uh, the divergent boundary uh, means uh, at this boundary or the fault line, two plates uh, move apart uh, creating a wider gap and uh, this process basically is responsible or was responsible for the creation of the ocean. The movement of the plates outward that leads to some kinds of stresses and strains produced within the plate itself and uh, that uh, cause uh, there is in turn some earthquake uh, in the inside region of the plate uh, which again will uh, uh, describe little more in details. Faults at the plate boundaries uh, are the likely locations for earthquakes and these uh, earthquakes are called the interplate earthquake. The earthquakes uh, also do occur within the plate because of the stresses and the strain that are developed due to the movement of the plate that I uh, told you just before. And uh, when the, the stresses uh, reach some limiting value within the plate, then there is a slip of rock bed uh, releasing energy there and uh, this kind of earthquake is known as the interplate earthquake. The slip uh, that takes place uh, within the plate uh, where the earthquake uh, takes place that creates new faults, uh, but it is generally said that the faults are mainly the causes uh, of the earthquake rather than results of earthquake or in other words the most of the major earthquakes and uh, uh, the uh, frequent earthquakes uh, they do take place uh, near the fault. The uh, earthquakes that do occur within the plate itself creating a new fault that process is rather uh, rare or less. At the fault uh, two different types of slippages are observed. Uh, one is called the deep slip, the other is called the uh, strike slip. Uh, the deep slip is uh, shown in this figure. We can see that in the case of the deep slip, uh, the two plates uh, move on an inclined plane uh, like this or like this. 
whereas in the case of the strike slip, uh, two plates move parallel to each other uh, in this particular fashion or, or forming what is known as the transform boundary. Uh, in reality, a combination of the different types of slippage uh, is observed at the fault line. Now, with this uh, background of the plate tectonics, uh, let us uh, look into the causes of earthquake. Uh, there are many theories to explain uh, the causes of earthquake. Uh, out of them, the tectonic theory of earthquake is most popular. The tectonic theory stipulates that movements of tectonic plates relative to each other lead to accumulation of stresses at the plate boundaries and also uh, sometimes inside the plate. This accumulation of stresses whether at the plate boundaries or within the plate finally results in interplate or interplate earthquakes. In interplate earthquake the existing fault lines are affected while uh, in the interplate earthquake new faults are created within the plate. Uh, during earthquake slip takes place at the fault the length uh, over which this uh, slip takes place could be several kilometers and the earthquake origin that travels all along this uh, line and therefore, uh, the earthquake origin is a point that moves along the fault line. The elastic rebound theory uh, proposed by Reid uh, gives credence uh, to earthquake caused by slip along fault lines. The large amplitude shearing displacement that took place over a large length along San Andreas fault led to the elastic rebound theory proposed by Red. In order to understand the elastic rebound theory, uh, let us look at this figure. The figure shows uh, the, uh, the left hand figure or left side figure shows a number of parallel fences and uh, these uh, uh, fences are on the surface of the ground. Uh, below the fences at the crust level there exists a fault line which is perpendicular to the direction of the fences. Now, uh, before the earthquake takes place, the two plates on either side of this fault line they move parallel to each other uh, like uh, those in a transformed fault. And uh, because of this uh, movement of the two plates parallel to each other, uh, the strains uh, are created at the gap or at the fault line over here. The strained layers uh, are depicted over here uh, because of uh, the movement and the resulting uh, straining of the layers. The poles which are existing on the fences, they are drifted apart in the direction of the motion and the uh, layers uh, are now uh, taking a shape like this. Uh, this is just before the earthquake. Uh, when the strains uh, which are accumulated uh, along these fault line, uh, they reach a limiting value of the strain, then the crushing of the material takes place uh, over the length of the fault line uh, and as a result of that 
uh, there is a release of energy and, and the earthquake takes place. Uh, now, as soon as this release of energy takes place, then these layers bounces back to its uh, original position or in other words they again become parallel, but creating a permanent drift uh, between the two layers or between the two poles in the direction uh, of uh, the fault line. So, this is a typical picture of the fences that was observed after the earthquake. Now, the uh, modeling of earthquake based on elastic rebound theory uh, is of two types. Uh, one is the kinematic uh, time history of slip in which uh, the slip is continuously monitored over time and uh, we have a time history of the slip that or uh, relative movement that takes place between the two plates. Uh, the other was uh, other is the dynamic shear crack and its growth. Uh, so, the, uh, the cracks that takes place uh, and how it grows is monitored over time. Uh, so, uh, based on that uh, we can model also the uh, rebound theory. An earthquake caused by sleep at the fault proceeds in the following way uh, or in other words uh, we can uh, summarize how or the earthquake is caused uh, due to the slip. Uh, owing to various slow tectonic activities, uh, strains accumulate at the fault over a long time. Large field of strain reaches a limiting value at some point of time. Then slip occurs due to crushing of rock and masses. The strain is released releasing vast energy equivalent to blasting of several atom bombs. So, the energy that is released uh, is, uh, is very, very large and uh, the strained layers of rock masses bounces back to its unstrained condition and uh, this is known as the elastic rebound theory. Now, the slip uh, could be of any type uh, that we have uh, uh, described before that is deep strike or mixed uh, giving rise to a push and pull forces as uh, shown in this figure. Uh, this is uh, before the uh, earthquake. Uh, so, uh, the, the layers uh, are strained over here two layers are strained and after the earthquake takes place. Uh, the uh, strained layers they bounces back to its parallel position uh, creating a permanent uh, drift and uh, this movement of uh, the two plates um, uh, as a uh, elastic body uh, creates uh, the push and pull forces. Uh, these uh, push and pull forces uh, they in fact uh, make the energy to propagate in all directions uh, that uh, uh, we will uh, see in the next slide. Uh, the slip velocity at an active fault uh, is about 10 to 100 millimeter per year. The you know, push and pull forces can be conceived of as a double couple like this. And uh, uh, this kind of double couple of forces uh, that is uh, generated uh, at the place where the earthquake takes place. As a result of that, we have uh, the forces uh, occurring in this direction as well as perpendicular to this direction. Uh, and uh, in this direction, basically, the wave start propagating. Uh, so, therefore, uh, the waves uh, uh, produced due to the earthquake, they propagate in all directions uh, from the uh, point it is uh, generated. And uh, these waves uh, pass through 
the crust as well as uh, the soil layer overlying uh, the crust. Propagation uh, of the wave uh, is a very, very complex process and uh, is uh, responsible for creating displacement and acceleration of the materials of the medium. And uh, these uh, displacements and acceleration of the particles of the medium uh, that uh, basically we uh, measure on the top of the ground and that gives us uh, what is known as the earthquake record. The majority of the waves uh, travels uh, through the rocks uh, within the crust and then passes uh, through the soil to the top surface. This process of the generation uh, of the waves uh, can be explained uh, from a simple example. Uh, if we uh, consider a pool of water, uh, in that if we throw a stone, uh, then immediately uh, there is a input of energy uh, into the water mass. And because of uh, this uh, energy input, the ripples are created and the energy that is inputted travels uh, uh, by creating these uh, ripples in the water medium uh, known as the uh, water waves. And uh, it passes energy from one point uh, to the other. In the process also, uh, it uh, temporarily or uh, locally uh, moves the medium particles uh, up and down, uh, but it does not carry the materials uh, along with it or the particles of the materials along with it. The other theory of tectonic earthquake uh, stipulates that earthquake occurs due to phase changes of rock mass, not because of the uh, slippage or the slip that takes place uh, at the fault lines. And these uh, phase change of rock mass is accompanied by a volume changes uh, in a small volume of crust. And uh, this in turn creates what is uh, uh, known uh, as the uh, tectonic earthquake. The volume change uh, which is associated with the changes uh, of the phase of the rock mass uh, is again uh, uh, is created uh, due to convective current that is continuously taking place in the mantle. Uh, those who favor uh, these theory uh, they argue that the earthquakes do occur at greater depths where faults do not exist. And therefore, uh, the theory uh, based on the slippage of the rocks at the fault line, they no more becomes valid. Now, let us uh, come to the seismic waves that are created uh, due to the release of energy at the point where earthquake takes place. Uh, the large strain energy which is released during earthquake uh, propagates in all directions uh, because of the push and pull forces uh, that we uh, described before. Uh, the seismic waves uh, move uh, within an elastic medium. Uh, this elastic medium is the medium uh, which is primarily consist of the solid uh, rocks or the crust uh, plus uh, the overlying soil on that. Uh, these waves called seismic waves uh, transmit energy from one point to the other and finally uh, carry it to the surface. And uh, how the seismic waves uh, transmit energy from one point to the other that was uh, discussed uh, in uh, 
just before by giving an example of a pool of water. Uh, within the earth, the waves travel in almost a uh, homogeneous elastic unbounded medium uh, because uh, uh, within the earth uh, itself uh, the when the earthquake waves move uh, it moves uh, within a very large uh, volume and therefore uh, we can say that uh, the elastic waves are moving within an unbounded uh, medium and uh, these earthquake waves which are uh, moving within the uh, earth itself is uh, called the body wave. Uh, when these uh, waves arrive on the surface, they move as surface waves. The reflection and refraction of the waves uh, do take place uh, near the surface at every layer. Uh, because uh, we have seen uh, that the, um, the, uh, the in interior of the earth is uh, consisting not only of a, a few large uh, layers uh, called crust, mantle and so on, but within the crust itself we have several layers and uh, the layers which are uh, adjacent to the uh, surface of the ground they are the reflection and refraction of the waves do take place and uh, as a result of that the nature of the waves uh, get modified or get changed. Uh, the body waves are of two types P and S waves. Uh, S waves are also called the transverse waves. The P waves are shown over here in the P wave uh, the particles of the medium uh, move in the same direction of the uh, seismic wave, whereas in the S wave uh, the particles move perpendicular uh, to the direction of the uh, wave propagation. Uh, the other two are called the uh, love and Rayleigh waves, uh, they are uh, different categories of the surface waves. Uh, but before I discuss that, uh, let me show you uh, with the help of this figure uh, the kind of reflection and refraction that takes place uh, near the surface. Uh, for example, here the P wave after reflection uh, becomes a S wave, uh, so then it is called a SP wave. Similarly, there is a P S wave, that is S S wave, that is a P P wave. P P wave signifies that after the reflection the wave remains again the P wave. The surface waves which are propagating on the surface of the earth, they are in fact are the polarized transverse waves either in the vertical plane or in the horizontal plane. These surface waves are of two types, the L waves called love waves or the R waves called the Rayleigh waves. The A waves uh, here the particle move in horizontal plane uh, perpendicular to the direction of wave propagation and in the R wave the particles move in an elliptical path uh, which is uh, shown in this figure. Uh, this is the love wave, in the love wave uh, the particles move uh, in the horizontal uh, plane, whereas in the Rayleigh wave the particles move in a retrograde elliptical path. The wave propagation velocities are given by these two equations, equation 1.1 and 1.2. The first equation uh, gives the velocity of the P waves, the second equation uh, gives the velocity of the uh, S, waves, S waves. Uh, the E is the modulus of elasticity, G is the modulus of shear modulus of rigidity, rho is the mass density and nu is the Poisson ratio. The P waves uh, arrive ahead of S waves at a point and the time interval 
between them is given by equation 1.3. Uh, if delta is the uh, distance between the two points, then uh, this is the uh, time uh, gap between the primary wave and the S waves. Now, as the you know, waves uh, come onto the surface, uh, then uh, one can uh, measure the earthquake rec uh, records uh, by measuring the ground displacement and accelerations. And uh, this shows, this figure shows a typical uh, recorded ground acceleration. Left hand side is the point. Um, uh, of uh, uh, interest or, or the site itself and we can see that the P waves arrive first followed by PP, then followed by S waves, then follow, followed by SS waves and at the, uh, at the end we get the surface waves. Now, these uh, waves can be classified uh, into uh, four categories. Uh, first one is practically a single shock. Uh, it occurs near the source that is if we take a record near the source, we will uh, get uh, this kind of stress. Uh, it is uh, observed in the firm ground and for shallow earthquake. And then we have got moderately long irregular trace of earthquake. Uh, this is observed uh, for uh, places which are at moderate distance from the source, uh, also recorded on firm ground. An example is uh, that of El Centro earthquake. Uh, the a long ground motion with prevailing period. Uh, this is a typical. Uh, this typically happens when there is a soft soil and the ground motions gets filtered through the soft soft soil. The example is the Loma Prieta earthquake and finally, the ground motion which uh, involving uh, the large scale ground deformation uh, that, uh, that is a disastrous earthquakes where landslides, soil liquefaction etcetera do take place. The examples are Chilean and Alaska earthquake. Uh, the most ground motions are intermediate uh, between those described before or, or mixed type. Amongst them, uh, nearly white noise uh, type of earthquake record having a variety of frequency compositions are more frequent on firm, uh, firm ground. Uh, these earthquake records are called broadband earthquakes. Narrowband earthquakes uh, are the ones uh, which are typically observed in the soft soil where concentration of energy uh, is limited within a small band of frequency that is how it is called a narrow band earthquake. Uh, this figure shows uh, the single shock uh, kind of record and one can see that after the first shock itself the uh, ground records they almost die down. This is the mixed uh, kind of uh, ground record uh, which uh, are frequently observed uh, in most of the earthquakes you know, on firm ground. Uh, this has a mixed frequency and uh, uh, has a broadband characteristics that is the energy uh, of the earthquake is distributed over a a large range of frequency and uh, this is uh, the ground record uh, taken for uh, the soft soil condition. Uh, there, uh, there is a predominant frequency as I told you uh, and uh, around that frequency the most of the energy is concentrated. So, this is the predominant frequency one can see. We have uh, different kinds of the earthquake traces you know, or the four categories of the earthquake traces that I uh, described before. Uh, so, with this earthquake records, we uh, make uh, many kinds of earthquake inputs uh, that we will be describing in the subsequent lectures.